Baselines is sponsored by Hug Your Money. Professional financial coaching, debt management, budgeting, retirement planning, and more. Schedule your free consultation with a Hug Financial Coach today. Hug Your Money. So unique, it's patented. For more information, visit HugYourMoney.com. And by West Side Walk Trio, inspired by the Jerry Mulligan Chet Baker Quartet. Cool West Coast style jazz in a pianoless trio. Contact Dominic Posha, 413-585-8769. I'm Francis Rayum, and this is Baselines, a place where we make time to reminisce. We'll take you behind the scenes with celebrities through stories told directly by the man who worked with them. So turn your cell phones off, cozy up, Maybe get a cup of tea, you're not going to want to miss this. And please welcome into your hearts my friend, professional bassist, instructor, and conductor, Mr. Don Baldini. Welcome, Don. Welcome back. Welcome back. All right. Now, talking about who we were going to talk about today, because this is sort of a clown's pocket of right, things. Right, an ongoing uh, the last, scenario. The last time you were here in the studio, um, your wife, Rebecca, had been taking down names of people <laughs> that you worked with. And she, you had put them in your little black book. And I took, I took just a, a glance at your little black book. Now, I've blown it up here so that I can see it. And I just want to play like a little word association. If I mention somebody, I know you will have a story. OK. OK. Let's see. Who should we start with? How about Toshiko Akiyoshi? Toshiko Akiyoshi, very, very special lady. Um, uh, she's actually Manchurian. When she was very young, she fell in love and married a very famous alto player on the Stan Kenton band by the name of Charlie Mariano, legendary, you know, downbeat pole winner. They got married, moved to this country, and she wound up going to the Berkeley School and studying music. Uh, they, at some point, got divorced. Um, she then wound up in New York and married a tenor player by the name of Lou Tobacco, who is also a very, very excellent tenor saxophone. She liked the sax players. Jazz player. Yeah, and I relate um, to that. they eventually moved to Los Angeles and uh, she started what we used to call a rehearsal band or a, a kicks band. In other words, musicians to get together to play someone's arrangements for fun of it and for the challenge of uh, yeah. just getting to play new music. Keeping I can't think up. of any other. Can you imagine <clears throat> a bunch of accountants getting together on a Saturday night and uh, working numbers? Can you imagine any other profession? To keep their chops this? up? I, no, I, mean, I don't you, know. You know, you and I both have the association with, well, with the AMS yeah. Jazz Orchestra yeah. that gets together once a month and play. Right. I mean, musicians do this all over the country. So anyway, getting back to Toshiko, she started this band and because it was Los Angeles, and because of uh, the caliber of musicians there, uh, the band had some pretty accomplished players. Now, when we're saying she started a band, we're talking about a big band. A big band, yeah. Seven Five eights. saxes, yeah. four trombones, four trumpets, rhythm section. She's yeah. a pianist. 17 pieces total. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, she's a wonderful pianist. In fact, um, she made quite a few recordings on her own. But anyway, she got into, she was a huge fan and was influenced a lot by Duke Ellington. At some point, Lou, her husband, um, convinced her that some of the arrangements she had been doing were worthy of getting some players together. So anyway, she started this big band. And um, Jean Chirico, was the bass player, who was the bass player was Sinatra, who I followed with Sinatra. Uh. I also followed him on the Toshiko band. So anyway, what happened was is that he got an unexpected call uh, from something having to do with Sinatra and had to miss a rehearsal. So they were looking for a bass player. And Bobby Shue, 
a oh, very yeah. renowned lead trumpet player, yeah. who was a friend of mine who I knew from Las Vegas, oh. uh, had heard that I'd moved to town. So, you know, luckily I was home. Luckily I had my act together. Luckily uh, my car was working. So I get a call, I, you know, hey, Baldini, I hear you're in town. Get your butt down to the musicians union. We're having a rehearsal with Toshiko. So I knew about the band, and so I went down there, um, and I've always been a good reader. Uh, her music was extremely difficult, mm. um, and her she wrote out everything herself. Uh, she did not hire a copyist, which was expensive. Yeah. She never studied calligraphy. Uh, uh, musical notation is a work of art. Yes. Her her handwriting was not good. Oh, um, dear. It was very difficult to read. And so apparently when they had been looking for bass players in the past, they had gone through a lot of guys yeah. that couldn't read the music. And then in a lot of cases, she would just say, you know. In other words, you know the changes. Or oh, you no. know what's going on. Or, <laughs> That's your or, instruction you know, on the Or sheet? she would write out, yeah. say, 12 bars at the beginning, and then she would just kind of you know, ditto it. So it was very difficult. You had to have yeah. a good memory. Yeah. And so, well, your reading skills have always well, been very strong. I was in Las yeah. Vegas. You know, I read everything from the big stars to like, you know, yeah. Russian bear acts and dog acts from <laughs> Yugoslavia. Bear and, acts. You know, her music was, was known to be very difficult. Uh, I had heard other people talk about it. And as it turns out, you know, it's a very funny thing about life and the music business especially one thing often leads to another so anyway I'll, I'll get to what it led to which was really important so i go in i'm kind of rumpled because i didn't even take a shower and i go in and i play and they they love it you know i i play with the drummer peter donald who was who was a kind of he had really great time, great rhythm, great sense of tempo. It's always nice in a drummer. But yeah. he also was very creative. Yeah, yeah. And she did not play piano very much on the band. So oh, really? basically the rhythm section was bass and drums. Oh. Typically in a big band you had piano, often guitar. Or guitar, right. And you know, guitar. playing the chords. Right. So, it, yeah. so it was unusual in that respect. Hmm. But I'm not a fancy player. My claim to fame is time. Yeah, you lock you it know, in. I mean, you I, lock I, you it in. You could shoot me and I would it's still, I mean, really I true. literally, you know, I'm not bragging, but no I mean, matter that's what. my thing. No matter what, I can we keep can always count on you. forever. And, you know, my biggest yeah. problem uh, most places is that, um, you know, tempos like to drop. Well, anyway. Mm -hmm. Or speed so, up or get faster. I'm so sure. I, I did a good job, I guess. And a couple of the guys, Lou Tobacken for one, and a couple of the other members of the of her band were playing on the Tonight Show band. Mm -hmm. So I guess the word was out that Toshiko's bass chair was difficult, mm -hmm. and other people had tried to do it. And so they went to the rehearsal that day with Doc and said, oh, hey, this guy came in and read Toshiko's book. So guess what? A week later, I get called to sub on The Tonight Show. Yeah. So I guess, I guess if there's any young people watching, you know, the, the lesson to learn from this is you are always on stage at Carnegie Hall, which is what my old teacher, Elmer Slama, told me. In other words, yeah. in the music business, you can never have a bad day or a down moment. You need to be your best all the time because you never know. I had no idea that going and playing with Toshiko's rehearsal mm -hmm. would wind up in me getting a call for The Tonight Show. Sure. Had I not done a good job, I wouldn't yeah. have been, they wouldn't have gone and said to Doc, oh, this guy came in and read Toshiko's book. And the well, next thing you know, I'm getting called to sub on The Tonight Show. So that, that turned out to be, Bobby Shue's call to me turned out to be a very, very important milestone in my musical career because... Yeah in subbing on The Tonight Show, mm -hmm. word gets around, hey, there's this new guy in town. Within the f first week, he's playing with Toshiko and he's subbing on The Tonight Show. We better check this guy yeah, out. Who is this So cat? suddenly I became like, you know, n maybe not desirable, but a curiosity anyway. For sure. And so I started getting other calls.
So it's really interesting. You know, had I not been home that morning, had I been somewhere else, had I been hung over, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that would have been it. And I also used to tell my students that the door doesn't open. You know, it squeaks open maybe a half an inch. Yeah. And that's when Get you in make there. your move. Get in there, There's yeah. no such thing as, like, the perfect opportunity. And you know, it's almost always when you don't expect it. What's interesting about that is that's, that's a really good piece of advice for any performer. Because what do people say? Well, it's just a gig. It's not Carnegie Hall. So to have somebody say to you, look, you're always on at Carnegie Hall. Pay attention to how you're behaving, right. how you're dressed, right. how you're performing, right. who you're Play working tune, with, how be clean, easy you are to work ready. with. You bet. You know. Well, yeah. getting back to yeah. Toshika. So as yeah. it turned out, um, it was a very satisfying band. And initially, we, we got a lot of attention because it was a true jazz band. I mean, mm -hmm. we were not playing anything that was commercial at all. In fact, most of her background, of course, is, is Asian. And so a lot of her music related to her upbringing and her Asian background. Mm -hmm. She had a couple of pieces which um, involved Asian musicians. Yeah. Um, you know, there's certain types of drums, and there's yeah. like a wooden flute. Anyway, yeah. so she wrote some of that into the compositions. And uh, so we played, you know, a few clubs around Los Angeles. We did go up to uh, the Monterey Jazz Festival, mm. which was up in uh, Northern California. Then, within a few months, we started getting recognized. You know, we won some downbeat awards. And we went to Japan. Mm -hmm. The first time, I think, we went for five or six weeks, wow. um, oh which was a huge undertaking. You take a 17-piece band. Taking that many musicians. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's one thing to go to Europe, mm -hmm. where we've all kind of been raised in that culture. The culture in Japan is totally different. In fact, one, I remember her saying to some of the guys, and of course they didn't believe her, if you guys want coffee in the morning, bring some instant coffee, Yeah. because all the hotel rooms have tea making paraphernalia, sure. but they Not don't coffee. have people. In yeah. Japan, going out for coffee is like going out for a cocktail. Oh, really? It's yeah. a special drink. Yeah. It's not something you drink in the morning. Yeah. And so, you know, we learned that, you know, they drink green tea in the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. What about the food? The food was interesting. I've always liked Japanese food, but my knowledge of Japanese food was an American's knowledge, you know. That's right. Tempura. Uh huh. Um, what else can I think of? I mean, yeah. I had had sushi. Sushi, sake. But I had never had sashimi, which is oh. raw fish. Yeah. And I had never had some of the other things, and I'll never forget. So, just to back up a second, the very first trip to Japan, like you said, it's an amazing, an amazing undertaking for that many musicians. Mm. And Toshiko didn't have any help. She didn't have like. An assistant. Yep. As it turned She's out, when we got to Japan, she did. But on subsequent trips, she hired somebody to yep. be her kind of a roadie. But, you know, she had to do all the scheduling. She had to do all the planning. So we get to Tokyo. Well, first of all, we get on the plane, and, there, and Henry Mancini's musicians were also going to Japan. Ooh. And his trumpet player's name was Don Rader. And of course, Bobby Shu was our trumpet player, our lead trumpet player. And the two of them were friends. And this is an important part, so I'll include it. They decided to see which of them could drink all the way. It was a 16-hour flight in those days. Oh, no. We had a stopover in, in Hawaii. So I, I think that added to the time. But it was 16 hours total mm -hmm. from L.A. to Tokyo. Yeah. And they had decided that they would see. And anyway, so by the time we got to Tokyo... Bobby Shue was like three sheets to the wind, as they say. So we get to the Tokyo airport. We get off the plane, and there are all these photographers. I mean, you'd think we were the Beatles. Well, I mean, there were probably yeah. two dozen. I had no idea, first of all, that jazz is a big thing in Japan. I was just going to ask you They that. have yes. journals. Yep. They have clubs. Yep. Dedicate, you know, they have like clubs dedicated to Duke Ellington, where well, you walk in, that's all they play is Duke Ellington's music. Everything American is a yeah, big deal in Japan. they love jazz. jazz. I found, Let's for example, 
some albums that had been discontinued here yeah. that you could still buy there. It was oh. just amazing. Huh. So anyway, we get off the plane, and there's all these photographers. And I guess Toshiko didn't know this, but um, the Jap JVC, the Japanese Victor Corporation, is the Japanese version mm -hmm. Of RCA, mm -hmm. they were in charge of kind of our Tokyo, you know, yep. uh, the Tokyo part of the trip, yeah. which was the first leg, and they had this conference room set up, you know, with this big U-shaped table, and all these photographers, and they're they're wanting to ask us all questions. You're interviewing and the you. funny part of the story is, Bobby Shu was the one that they knew because he had been on Buddy Rich's band. The rest of us oh, yeah. were pretty much nobodies, Jeez, but Bobby Shu was the one. And so he was, like I said, three sheets to the wind. He barely could hold on. <laughs> and they were asking him all these questions, oh, no. and he was giving these very slurred answers. So it was all quite funny. It's like doing a Dean Martin skit, right? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we yeah. finally finished with that. And we go to the hotel. Oh, my gosh. And we were staying in what was called a Japanese businessman's hotel, which was basically like we would say, like a just basically just a room basic, like and a, a hotel, not a hotel. You know, no, yeah. no, no, no luxuries, yeah. no amenities, and hmm. I was fine because I'm like five five. Yeah. But we had some kind of tall guys in the band, and they had trouble because the beds were all small. My room was so small that I couldn't have my base in the room. Wow. I had to put my base in like a maid's, a maid's closet down the <laughs> hall because the room was that small. And I remember wow. literally, Japanese real estate. we used to call them our Yamaha toilets. Oh, you no. literally could sit on the john, brush your teeth and take a shower at the same time. I mean, yeah. the whole bathroom was made to get wet. Yep. Yep. I mean, it was like, like literally being in a bathroom on a train, wow. you know, it was a, so that was a big, all right, so anyway, Co we do our big estate. opening concert. Yeah. And this is a, it's very funny how, how in life things are connected. We played at a place called the Budokan, which is a martial arts hmm. stadium. I mean, it's an arena, it's yeah. an indoor, Enormous, but yeah. it's made for martial arts yeah. mostly. And it holds about, I don't know, between 50 and 60,000 people. Yeah. I later played there with Sinatra. That's where we played in Japan later yeah. on. So that's kind of funny, too, is that, you know, a few years later, I'm at the same place, That'd be not weird. with Toshiko, but with yeah. Frank Sinatra. Yeah. All right, so we're at the Budokan, and it was amazing. And the band sounded amazing. And, and um, so anyway, yeah. after the gig, the JVC Corporation hosted a reception at this very, very fancy restaurant. And... Um, now is when we found out what real Japanese food was like. Mm -hmm. So we go to this place, and of course, you know, you're sitting at the low table, and we're all having a good time, and the sake is, it, that's the other thing I discovered, just sake is like wine. It depends where it's made. It, there's many different Lots types of, different of sake. Types of it sake. doesn't all taste the same. Yeah. So we're drinking sake. I never was much of a drinker, so it didn't take me very long to start feeling pretty good. And they brought out this, the ceramic urn it was about literally about a yard in, in diameter, and there was a Bunsen burner on the table, kind of like what we call, you know, the days of Mongolian barbecue where they would mm -hmm. cook right at the table. Yeah. And they fill it with all this liquid, and we look inside, and it's nothing but fish heads. Oh yeah. And oh. those are a delicacy. I had I never know. realized that yeah. the cheeks yeah. of a fish. It's like eating the claws of a lobster. Mm -hmm. The fish is so delicate yeah. and so wonderful. And that's basically what the deal is. But huh. here we are. So, so there's this huge thing. And of course, as it's heating up, it's starting to smell pretty good. And these fish heads start bobbing to the top. Now, we're starting to get feeling pretty good. So we're saying, hey, look at that one. It looks like, you know, some oh, friend no. back home. Oh. oh, that one looks like Charlie Shavers. That one looks... So, you know, so we start... Well, now we start eating, and the fish head thing was pretty good. I mean, it was pretty good uh, in the broth. But then they brought out these, some kind of sea urchins. They were alive. They were alive, yeah. They oh. were alive. Oh, oh. Got it kind of got me there, yeah. So we drank a lot of sake. That mm. was our first. I mean, there was no tempura. There was no sushi. There was no sukiyaki or any of those American, mm. Japanese. This was yeah. like the real deal. And uh, 
The good thing that saved my my butt was that there were a lot of vegetables, and I like ah, vegetables. Good. So, but unusual things. Yeah. So that was our first experience in Japan. And from there, we were in Tokyo. I think we were in Tokyo for about a week, and then we started touring all over the country. Hmm. We went up to Sapporo, which is in, in the Northern Island, and I'll never. I mean, it was like, well, it was January, so it was cold. And uh, we had so many adventures, and the big thing in Japan is fish. You know, if you get a if you get a, a package of snacks, yeah. like what we would call check mix, yeah, it would have minnows, dried minnows in it. Yeah. So the Japanese are so clever. I mean, first of all, the culture itself is so different. Mm. Like for example, when you get into the snow areas, the, the sidewalks are heated. Right. They never have right. to shovel the, the snow off the side. Well, I mean, do why don't we do that? I mean, it's obviously expensive, but once you yeah. do it once, it's there forever. That's right. All right, so anyway. As long as it works, yeah. One of my buddies, we're walking around in the afternoon. We see this guy. Um, they looked like little donuts. We should have realized, because they were shaped like fish, ah. that that was a, a tip-off. But yeah. we, were, we were stupid. We were naive. So we see these... He's got this big iron, and he's putting this batter in. What we didn't see was there was a little hole on the side where he was squirting what we thought was like jelly. It looked like like a jelly donut. Like a jelly it was this donut. Red, yeah. Then you know this red substance. So we figure, oh, these are going to be like jelly donuts, you know. And he takes them out, and he rolls them in powdered sugar, puts them in a bag, and sells them for whatever. Surprise. So we think, oh, this is great. You know, we're going to get some. Because we were getting pretty, pretty desperate for some American food. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we had been in Japan like two or three weeks, yeah. eating a lot of fish and a lot of strange yep. things. So anyway, well, of course, yeah. they're hot. Can you imagine putting something in your mouth that you think is a donut, yeah. which is not? What was it? And then the, what we thought would be jelly yeah. was fish paste. Uh, and it was hot. Oh boy. Because it was still warm, you know. Yeah. And this thing like, you know, you you squish down on this in your mouth uh, and this hot fish paste. Oh, and you're expecting a jelly and donut. And you're expecting like a jelly donut. Uh, so that was yeah. pretty weird. That's but, weird. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the people were very gracious. As mm -hmm. it turned out, we wound up playing for a, again, something that I think is very rare here. There are a lot of private clubs. Mhm. Mm that just get together for jazz yeah. happenings. Yeah. They either bring in artists or they get together and listen to recording. So we played for a lot of private jazz clubs in various locations all over Japan. And they were, you know, anywhere from 50 to 100 people. And that was the bulk of, we did do some big concerts, but the bulk of during the week you know, we played in some small jazz clubs, mostly for these jazz societies. And we found out that that's like a very common thing. How common was it to have uh, big bands at that time in Japan? That's a good question. Particularly I'm not jazz sure I even know bands. the answer to that. I'm not sure they had very many big bands. It, it seems I know like they had a lot of, they did have yeah. some artists that were pretty famous, some, some soloists. It seems like she was a visionary. And oh that's, yeah, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Well, and the other, you know, here's the other weird thing. They had all these, like, there's a very famous club in New York called the Five Spot. Mm -hmm. Well, they recreate. I've been to the Five Spot. It's in the Village. Yep. It's, you know, it's like water pipes and. Yeah. Well, they recreated on the recreated the Five Spot, on the tenth or twelfth story, of a high rise office building. Really? And there it was. You walk, get off the elevator, and you'd think you're in Greenwich Village. Like a movie set. Yeah, there it like was. a movie set. It was just unbelievable. Interesting. Yeah, they have a lot of clubs huh. like that. And there were, like I said earlier, there were clubs just dedicated to like Miles Davis yeah. or Duke Ellington. And we went, I remember we went into the Ellington one because that was Toshiko's favorite guy. And the other thing that was unusual is that there were... Suntory is one of the major whiskeys in Japan. Mm -hmm. And people would buy a whole bottle and then they would put their name like on a little kind of a little brass plate. Oh, yeah. They would put it on the bottle 
So once they paid for the bottle, they'd go in and they could just pour yeah. drinks. The well, other like they thing do with chopsticks. about yeah. the culture, the beers are huge. Yeah. And they're meant to share. In other words, the whole thing in Japan is drinking is a social thing. Mm -hmm. You don't drink not, alone. Not you, to it's drink and get drunk, right? something to share with yeah. other people. Yeah. So that was all very unusual, you know. There's a lot of alcohol woven through this story, but I know you not to be much of a drinker. No, I'm not. I mean, so I guess I would ask, I mean, nobody prepped Bobby Shu or the band for what was about to happen. No. And here you are saying, well, you're always on Carnegie. You're always yeah. at Carnegie Hall. And here's Bobby Shu, you know, having a drinking contest on the way. Uh, there was no reprimanding or anything. He just got through it. And nobody cared. Nobody cared. Interesting. And we had a lot of adventures. In fact, um, we played in some part, well, getting back to Tokyo, we played a concert one night in an area of Tokyo that was almost like a shanty town. I mean, we were in this very busy commercial area, but overhead, in other words, there were all these shops, and overhead were these big pieces of like roofing material, like, you know, corrugated metal roof. But yeah. it wasn't attached to anything. It was just like hanging up there. So the, sp the spaces on either side of the roofing material, the rain could come down. Yeah. So it was very strange. And I remember huh. one of the things I'll never forget, because I hate snakes, uh -huh. is that there was a, what do you recall, it, some kind of religiously affiliated shop that was selling all kinds of odd things, including live snakes. Mm. And I remember we saw this kind woman snakes. walking with this bag, and the bag was was moving. And then we saw she had just come out of this snake shop. She Ugh. just bought several live snakes. I don't know what she was going to do with them, but we I, were like, oh, my God. you know? Do they, who Maybe knows? they eat them. I don't know. Speaking of food, um, so, okay, so one night... We see a McDonald's. In fact, it was almost like a mirage. It was a very foggy. They get a lot of fog in the winter because they don't get the cold temperatures that we do, but it gets cold enough that anyway, there's a lot of moisture. And mm -hmm. anyway, there was a lot of fog. And one night we were, we were on a break. We were playing at this jazz club and we were on a, I think we were doing like two or three sets. So we had like an hour. And it was a kind of a small town in the southern part of the main island. And a bunch of us were walking around. We saw the golden arches, like through the fog. It was yeah. a weird. And like, of course, we all. And of course, everything there was fish flavored. Sure, yeah. I mean. Yeah, McDonald's in Japan is yeah. not the same as it is. And the same thing States. happened in Osaka. Yeah. Osaka is a very big city. And there's a castle. Um, yeah. used to belong to one of the warlords. It's a huge. And here was a guy looked like he was selling hot dogs on a stick. Yeah. And, of course, we raced over there. Peter Donald, the drummer, was the first one to get one. And he took a bite and went like, oh, my God, it tastes like fish. So that was, you know, part of the getting used to. But the people were very gracious. In yeah. fact, just the other day, I was cleaning out some papers, and I found this gorgeous little sketch that this guy had done of me oh. and gave it to me as a gift. And I'm going to frame it because it's just beautiful. I'm going to ask for a copy of that. We'll get it into the show. Yeah. And I'm also going to ask if we can continue this conversation. Okay. Um, but we have to go for well, now. Are we done? We're out of time for, we're again, time. we're out of time again. Okay. But we will continue this conversation. Okay. Well, thank right. you. Well, thank you for sharing all these stories. I'm Francis Rayum. This is Don Baldini. <laughs> we're signing off from Baselines again. And just remember... You don't have to thank us or laugh at our jokes. Sit deep and come often. You're one of the folks. We'll see you at our next visit right here on Baselines. Thank you. Baselines is sponsored by Hug Your Money. Want a financial landscape you can see over? This is what it feels like to work with a Hug financial coach. Hug Your Money. So unique, it's patented. And by... Ask Me Now, a vocal group providing sophisticated music for your next event. Contact Francis at 413-885-8888 or visit askmenow.live.